If there's one thing you can count on Remedy to do, it's not only wear their inspiration on their chest, but create an elaborate flag and theme song for when they parade their inspirations down the street. With Max Payne, it was hard-boiled noir detective fiction and laxative commercials. Alan Wake might as well have given Stephen King a byline somewhere in the game when you consider how many times they mentioned him. And then Quantum Break tried to be a Netflix series you gave up watching halfway through the season. It's actually a touching gesture. Remedy lets you know right off the bat that you should probably be consuming the source of their inspiration rather than their own product. Control's inspirations are immediately obvious. Maybe a little too obvious, in fact. SCP Foundation is a popular and creative horror wiki about a secretive and clandestine organization that collects and locks away dangerous and mysterious objects and monsters. Remedy made the mistake of believing the organization that locks up the SCP is more interesting than the SCPs themselves. And anyone who spent a long night being drawn from one wiki entry to the next can tell you that is the wrong take. Since SCPs are sourced from the active imaginations of the user base, you can pick one at random from the wiki and find something original every time. I'm not one to issue this criticism lightly. After all, one could point out that what I do isn't that far removed from the content you'd find on a TV tropes wiki. In Control, all the SCPs, or altered items as they call them, are ordinary things that sit there and the game has to talk them up as doing incredible things when you're not looking. And that applies to the characters as well, especially the protagonist Jesse. In my opinion, Remedy should probably be locked up inside the bureau as well for being something that looks pretty ordinary, but promises it will do great things when you're not looking, and also shouldn't exist in our reality since they haven't had a real success since Max Payne. And hell if I can figure out how they stay financially solvent. Control is not a great name for a game, so I guess it continues that tradition of Remedy Games. At this point, I have to assume they shoot their first impressions with potential buyers in the foot on purpose. What else am I supposed to think when they come up with the names like Max Payne, Alan Wake, and Quantum Break? Their idea seems to be to take whatever the main character is going through and somehow twist that into their title. Max Payne was dealing with a lot of internal and external pain. Alan Wake was living in a dream reality of his own creation. And Jesse needs to take control over her life. I know I shut you out sometimes. I'm always glad to hear from you. One of the more poorly executed ideas in Control is Jesse's dimensional helper, Polaris. Throughout the game, Jesse will have conversations with her. Conversations is in air quotes for a reason. Since Polaris never says anything, she's very much one of those metaphysical stand-ins for the player. You might recognize this idea from Deadly Premonition where it is infinitely more entertaining due to the nature of the protagonist's conversations with his invisible friend. Whereas Jesse just sort of assumes Polaris wants her to do something, lays that out, then moves along while clinging to Polaris like an awkward friend with self-esteem issues. They're lying to us. We're lying to ourselves. The room's not the world. The world is much bigger. The more you need to narrate in the opening of your story about how dark and mysterious the world actually is, the less I believe you unless you can pull off one hell of a Fox Mulder impression. You don't need all this telling when you have an entire game of showing ahead of you. Jesse came to the bureau to find her missing brother who was taken years ago after a paranormal event in their hometown. Her plan for getting him back seems to have been to show up in the lobby and request that the secretive government agency that isn't supposed to exist turn over her brother. All the technology inside the bureau is several decades behind current tech due to how the oldest house works. However, the HR rules seem to update to current trends and even blow past them because all the restrooms are unisex. I'm Ahti, the janitor, by the way. You will work for me. Ahti is one of the few characters you get to interact with in this game that isn't a copy-paste NPC or a live-action video you watch. I'm not sure if I like him as much as I like the idea of him, but the concept of a mysterious janitor who's actually some sort of god who's in charge of everything is something I like, because it sounds like one of those bizarre fan theories that appear to make a piece of fiction sound better than it actually was like Jar Jar being a Sith Lord. Jesse is made the new director of the Federal Bureau of Control by merely being the one to discover the previous director's body and pick up his magic transforming gun, and then winning a forced game of Russian roulette with it. A gun that I suspect only exists and has such importance placed on it because it was a lot easier to create animations for a single handgun than multiple guns that would require two hands to use. It's not a remedy game unless Sam Lake stops the flow of the story to pretend he's making a TV show. At least he went back to just doing short clips that are interspersed throughout the game and not full-length TV episodes. The service weapon is, of course, a prime example of an OOP, a very powerful one. I haven't played the Alan Wake DLC for Control yet, but I do wonder how they square away the fact that Alan Wake and Dr. Darling are played by the same actor. I guess it's fitting that Control and Alan Wake take place in the same universe, because the Hiss and the Taken are kissing cousins. A bunch of ordinary people taken over by evil miasma, or a SoundCloud file in the Hiss's case, that conveniently have enough intellect left over to wield human weapons. When you go to all the trouble of creating a government agency responsible for locking up things man was never meant to know about, I kind of expect the enemy list to be longer than guys who shoot at you with guns. Since the Hiss is a resonance-based intelligence that takes over the minds and bodies of those who hear it, and Jesse is the only person who is protected from it by Polaris, why did so many Hiss humans end up armed and ready for combat? There was no one here to fight until Jesse showed up. The Bureau seems to have been staffed by 90% security guards. Must cleanse control points. An enemy. Corrupt. Spreading them. 
The former director, Trench, who shot himself shortly after Jesse arrived, often speaks to Jesse, giving advice in broken sentences. However, by the end of the game, Jesse discovers that he is the one who let the Hiss invade the Bureau, so his ghost shouldn't be sharing information, and telling Jesse to cleanse control points of Hiss would be something he has no history of doing, so even the random memory excuse the game tries to fly later doesn't add up, since Trench would never have cleared control points of Hiss during his career. Jesse Faden. I'm just visiting. I should have lied. Oh shit! You're the new director! I'm not sure when the surviving employees got the memo that Jesse was a new director, since that only happened a few minutes ago, and anyone left alive is locked inside safe rooms. And I don't think the board inside their pyramid in another dimension can communicate with anyone other than the director. Look, somehow, this hostile force, this hiss, that works? Somehow the hiss managed to infiltrate the building without any warning. And just like that, my name for it is official. The hiss. Like the sound of poison gas leaking in. We're in full lockdown. Jesse's fortunate the other characters can tell when she's writing dialogue inside her own head, so they patiently wait for her to finish before continue to explain something important to her. Trench is dead. Shot. Ah. I found his body. And the gun. I don't really have a lot to say about our protagonist Jesse, not because she's a well-rounded character without fault, but because there really isn't a lot to say. If I were to list all the ways she's different from a silent main character, it would be that she can talk but never actually says anything. She spends most of the game talking to herself at that, along with her special friend inside her own head, and she recites her lines like she was instructed to balance dinner plates on sticks while reading them. And you entered the building when it was already in the lockdown, before you became the new director? How? Lockdown is not a term I would use for a building with open front doors and no one guarding the entrance. Jesse walked right in and took an elevator to the director's office. I don't know why the Hiss can't escape from the oldest house. They managed to gain entry into far more secure areas of the building. The Bureau was involved in an incident in my hometown, Ordinary, 17 years ago. Jesse's hometown's name is so tongue-in-cheek that I can't tell if they felt really satisfied with themselves over it or thought it was so cheesy they had to use it. This sin can be applied to a lot of the writing found in Remedy games. I can't tell her about Dylan and the rest yet. Why not? You're the boss now, and you saved their lives. You can demand whatever information you want from them. They call me the director. But that's not me. I'm not a director type. Not a leader. Maybe Jesse thinks she's narrating an audiobook to one of those novels about independent and strong females who are out to get answers in a world set against them, because most of her internal dialogue reads like the paragraph on the back of a book jacket. <laughs> Music is sparse in control, but whenever combat begins, you get to listen to what sounds like the opening drum solo in most Disturbed songs. There's a point where trying to be mysterious changes into annoying. The Ocean View Motel sections of control represent that moment quite nicely. Every once in a while, the objective will have Jesse click a light switch, which will send her to the motel, where she has to ring a desk bell a couple of times and rearrange furniture before the game will let her move on. It's not mysterious, it doesn't serve the narrative, and it just annoys me. <laughs> The board is the mysterious and clearly non-human leadership of the Bureau, which is a fine concept, but mainly all they do is make Jesse perform gameplay tutorials. Imagine if the G-Man was the one who taught Gordon Freeman how to crouch and jump over obstacles in Half-Life and you'll see my point. A director needs a team. My management team. These people know the secrets of the Bureau as well as I do. That actor from Quantum Break must be feeling left out, since Remedy brought back the actors for Max Payne and Alan Wake's protagonist to voice two of the major characters in Control. The other sectors. How do I get there? It's impossible because of the internal lockdown. You can perform a directorial override to lift it, but that can only be done in the maintenance sector. Normally, you take the sector elevator down there. It connects all the sectors, but it won't work while the lockdown is in effect. Why would you create an override for the lockdown, but then place it in a location that is cut off during a lockdown? How are lockdowns ever supposed to end at the place for overriding it is cut off from the director? I, mean, I would love to run some tests on you. I if you agree, that is. These tests are never run, but Pope will still manage to get results back from them. At least take a blood sample or something. Jesse never shows any curiosity over why Ati hasn't been corrupted by the Hiss despite not wearing an HRA. We the player know Ati is something more than a janitor, but Jesse doesn't. If lifting the internal lockdown changes the situation for the better without allowing the Hiss to escape, why was it locked down in the first place? Discussions with Pope would be more interesting if she wasn't glued to that office chair for every one of them. She spends the rest of the game sitting here fangirling over how impressed she is with every single thing Jesse does. If they were going for an employee sucking up to the new boss, then it would actually make some sense. But I don't think that's what they intended with Pope. I have a younger brother, Dylan. When we were kids, we found an old slide projector in Ordinary's landfill. The slides created doorways to other places. 
bad things happened. Came through. This is one of those rare times where the protagonist's backstory would make for a far more interesting game. You only hear details about what Jesse and her brother Dylan got up to as kids in Ordinary, but it's so much more fascinating that I'd much rather be playing that game over this one. Bureau agents took your brother? Yes. He covered it up. No one believed me. I just want to find Dylan. Jessie has a hard time recalling that she's the director now and in charge of the very organization that took her brother after the events that happened when they were kids. The first thing she should have done after assuming the position is demand all information on Dylan and where he was being kept. Instead, she remained silent and did what everyone told her to do even though she's in charge. Did Polaris know about the hiss? If she got you in here in spite of the lockdown, she's very powerful. The doors were open. If that was Polaris' doing, she could have been helping Jesse a lot more, because locked doors inside the oldest house continue to be a burden. How can I get to the research sector? Use my key card. The sector elevator will take you there. I guess the board only give the new director a gun and not a security car with max clearance to get around the facility they are in charge of now. Maybe go back and check Trench's pockets for a security badge. All of the remaining non-hiss corrupted security guards use World War I era Lewis guns. Modern technology lags decades behind due to some obscure rule on how the oldest house works. But if they can use computers and tech from the 50s and 60s, then surely security can use weapons from the same time period. And Lewis guns would be a poor choice for your standard firearm from that era. Lewis guns were either mounted to a vehicle or fixed on the ground and fired from a prone position. And despite the game talking about how modern tech doesn't work inside the oldest house, the internals of a gun are so straightforward they haven't changed all that much over the years. They even have modern weapons on the table in front of them but use Lewis guns instead. Darling created the HRAs in a lab nearby. We need more if we're gonna survive this attack. Why do you need more HRAs? All of the people who weren't wearing them when the hiss crossed over have been corrupted already. The only people remaining are the ones who are wearing them at the time. I need something from you first. What do you know about Dylan Faden? I knew this was coming. Lives are at stake here, and we need this machine working to save those lives. Once that is done, Director Faden, then we can talk. That's not how you talk to your boss. To create more HRAs, they need black rock prisms. And to get them, she has to set off an explosive mining charge that requires three huge battery cells connected to outlets right next to the charge. You can set off a bomb with an old Nokia cell phone. So I don't know what's up with this genius bit of engineering. Where is Dylan? He's kept in the containment sector, in the Panopticon. I think Pope probably could have wagered an educated guess that if the Bureau had taken Jesse's brother, that he was likely being held inside the Panopticon, which is the Bureau's prison for altered items and people. He's gone. Dylan isn't here. He might be nearby. Or maybe the hiss got to him. I don't know. Jesse, listen. Dylan's here. With us. He just walked in. He says he is giving himself up. He's been affected by the hiss, but he is different than the others. Dylan somehow broke out of his cell and made his way to the executive board room where the survivors hold up to turn himself in. However, the panopticon he was locked inside of with all the other altered items is a sealed area with only one entrance. He would have had to pass through it, but Langston would never let him through and never mentions Dylan escaping. Do you know who you are? Not Dylan. Trench and Darling made sure of that. But I'm better now. The hiss made me better. Dylan, who's been locked up inside the Bureau for years and has been corrupted by the Hiss, uses the name that Jesse came up with to refer to them, a name he's never heard her say. And since he's part of the Hiss, he would likely use whatever term they would describe themselves with. You must see the truth for yourself, Jesse. Sister. The horrible truth about the Bureau. The Hiss is the better option. Go to the Prime Candidate program in the containment sector. I have the key card to get you there. Dylan actually believes that whatever the Bureau was doing with the Sly Projector will convince Jesse that being the mind slave of extra-dimensional meth gibberish would be preferable. It was a game. We were in a game. And it was a fucking boring game. I wish more games were this upfront about themselves. Turns out the Bureau has been watching Jesse for years, and this revelation won't matter to Jesse or her objectives, and it's never brought up again. The Bureau created a scale model of Ordinary inside the oldest house to study the altered world event that occurred there. When creating a scale model, you tend to make the scale pretty small so it can fit on a desk, not the size of a football field. I'm setting up a new department. Dimensional research in the research sector. Huh? Transferring the slide projector there. Darling physically isn't present in this game. He disappeared during the Hiss invasion, but his vlogs managed to lead you around by the nose. It's a form of character development, I suppose. Sort of like watching a close friend slowly lose his grip on reality one Facebook post at a time. Take my cassette player. You can borrow it. The song is a present from my friends to you. It will get you through the maze so you can do your job. Take control. 
Poets of the Fall once again provide the theme song for a Remedy game, and just like in Alan Wake, it has some kind of magical power. The Ashtray Maze level is easily the best single part of the whole game and is worth a sin off. If the entire game had been more like this, I wouldn't have sat on my footage of this one for over a year before making a video when there was a gap in my schedule. The Bureau found the Hedron after they went through a portal opened by the Slime Projector, the same being that Jesse's Polaris is a part of, and it's the reason Polaris guided her here. Then Polaris instructs Jesse to turn off the HRA protecting the Hedron from the Hiss so Jesse can… well the game never mentions what Jesse or Polaris was going to do once near the Hedron. The Hiss destroy the Hedron, but they are only capable of doing it because the Bureau set up siphons all around it. This is the life form Darling believed would protect and save the Bureau once the Hiss invaded, he even set up the giant HRA in the door to keep them out, but didn't disable the siphons that could destroy it. With the Hedron destroyed, Polaris disappears and the Hiss corrupt Jesse. Then the game plays a fake credit sequence. This meta joke has gotten a bit overdone now, and this game isn't even meta enough to warrant it. Within the Hiss, Jesse isn't the director but an office worker performing thankless jobs over and over again without end, which I could swear is exactly what Jesse was doing when she was the director. I have a plan. An answer. I'll take the slide projector to the nostalgia department. I'll turn it on. I'll bring the hiss in. The hiss were able to invade after they got to Director Trench during an expedition into one of the slides, which led him to turn on the projector and let the hiss in after Darling found the Hadron and started equipping everyone with HRAs. Throughout the game, Jesse has received whispers of Trench's memories, but all disjointed enough or far back enough to never reveal that he was the cause of all this. Jesse kills Trench inside of her own head and then receives a call from Darling telling her that the Hadron wasn't the source of the signal, but the catalyst of one, which allows Polaris to reappear within Jesse freeing her from the Hiss. You would think the Hiss, who are the enemy of Hadron, would have known about that little fact and not prioritized destroying Hadron, but Jesse as well. When and how did Dylan escape from his cell in the executive area? Wouldn't all the Bureau employees there have been killed by Dylan or the Hiss if they had freed him from the HRA cell? The final climactic fight is just a slog through an army of enemies then pressing a button to win. With as many superpowers as Jesse has, you would expect a bit more, especially since the game has already had several boss fights, some of them optional. The ending is one of those non-endings where you're told that since the enemies are still around, you should go and clean up any lingering side quests, and then wait around a few months for the DLC to drop. And it was a fucking boring game.